a very good evening uh, a very good evening to everyone and a very warm welcome to all who are present for this cap academic series webinar now cap stands for knowledge attitude and practice and uh, we have many sessions on the internet where the anesthesia knowledge is imparted and many sessions are there on youtube itself but uh, only a few sessions are there where the attitude and practices are discussed so with a name to cover the subject of anesthesia in a more 360 degree manner this webinar series has been conceptualized by our very own now ex secretary dr navin malhotra sir now this is the second of the series and in the first we had a uh, we saw young anesthesiologists from all corners of the country uh, from delhi from dehradun kolkata mumbai hyderabad and uh, they showed us their talent which was and they were all ably guided by some very senior persons of repute from the country and today it is not going to be any different we have a galaxy of stalwarts today also uh, who will be discussing and guiding along with some young anesthesiologist stars on the career prospects that are available for the anesthesiologists Uh, in the different fields of anesthesia and uh, dr navin malhotra sir will be the moderator uh, dr monica thank you dr nishan now i would like to invite uh, respected dr navin malhotra sir to please say a few words so that we can begin the session thank you sir uh, thank you dr monica welcome to cap academic series session 2 of yuva stars and today's theme is career options after post graduation in different super specialties of anesthesiology i personally feel that pursuing a super specialty course is a second phase of life in any anesthesiologist so i have labeled it as anesthesiologist 2.0 prospects and challenges after post graduation after the post graduate exams you are excited you are thrilled that you have cleared the exams and you want to party all day all night because your exams have ended and you feel before the exams that after the exams you will change the whole world but after the exams you are doing only one thing and that is sleeping and within one week there is a feeling of emptiness and hollowness and then you start thinking about the career paths after post graduation and one of them is super specialization there are others also which will be covering up in the next session whether you want to work in a government sector or a corporate sector or you want to go back to state civil services or you want to go abroad or you want to start a freelance practice and also you want to build up career in defense services but doing a super specialization after md or dnb anesthesiology is a very important milestone and you have to be ready for the new chapter in your life because it will take a hard work also and that will determine the final destination and the final journey of your life and for that you have to appear in the exams also there are dm drnb courses and fellowship entrance examinations also so the neat ss exams or pet the fellowship entrance exam and we the anesthesiologist are eligible for dm drnb in cardiac anesthesia neuro anesthesia critical care medicine organ transplant anesthesia and critical care pediatric and neonatal anesthesia and medical genetics and for five of them the eligibility is md or dnb in anesthesia for critical care we compete along with general medicine pediatrics respiratory medicine and emergency medicine along with md or dnb anesthesia and we shall be discussing further the change pattern of neat super specialty critical care exam we have been defending this case along with the students isa and indian society for critical care medicine together and we successfully supported our cause in 2021 when honorable supreme court gave the decision in our favor that there is no need to change the exam pattern but subsequently in the year 2022 it was not decided in our favor when honorable supreme court said that the issue raised in this particular proceedings 
relates to pure question of academic policy bearing on the modalities for selection and admission to a super specialty course consistent with the restraint exercised by this court while exercising judicial review in such matters we are not inclined to entertain the petition but we have not stopped there we are following this along with iccm uh, to the nmc to the president post graduate medical education board to the ministry of health and family welfare and we hope that will take it to a logical conclusion the another important milestone was fet 2022 the fellowship entrance exam which was conducted by national board of examination and we the anesthesiologists are eligible for fnb fet courses in pediatric anesthesia onco anesthesia transplant anesthesia trauma anesthesia and critical care and pain medicine and it gives a feeling of immense satisfaction that our whole team from all across the country of esteemed anesthesiologists who were the members of the specialty board of anesthesiology of national board of examination uh, i had the honor of being its convener of the specialty board of anesthesiology of national board of examination when these courses uh, the fnb pain medicine curriculum was written by our own hands and the other courses dnb in onco anesthesia pediatric anesthesia trauma anesthesia and critical care were sanctioned and started the fet examination has two parts part a and part b part a has got 40% weightage from the feeder specialty and 60% is along the other super specialties another challenge came once you have done your super specialization some agencies consider the super specialist the dm or drnb pass candidates ineligible as faculty for the teaching institutes in the parent department of anesthesia and for that we had made representations to the upsc and other agencies that we strongly urge the upsc and other regulatory bodies to reconsider the matter and consider dm candidates the anesthesiology super specialist cardiac anesthesia neuro anesthesia onco anesthesia critical medicine eligible for broad specialty anesthesiology faculty recruitment as assistant professor and we are well willing to come physically also for scientific deliberations on the subject matter and i am happy to share that it was rolled back and the dm candidates were made eligible for faculty recruitments in the department of anesthesia also so now the biggest challenge is which one which one super specialization to choose and for that we have invited today esteemed panelists which will be led by dr deepak tampe and dr rajesh arya who will be talking about cardiac anesthesia Dr. Sheila Nayan Mehra and Dr. Harish M. M. who will be talking about critical care. Colonel Rakhi Goel and Dr. Geeta Nath who will be talking about pediatric anesthesia. Myself and Dr. Anurag Agarwal will discuss about pain medicine. Dr. H. S. Dash and Dr. Zufair Ali will be talking about neuro anesthesia. And Madam Shishma Bhatnagar and Dr. Anuja Pandit will be talking about onco anesthesia and palliative care. And they will be coordinated by Dr. Monica Chikara for critical care medicine. Dr. Deepika Budwar for cardiac anesthesia, Dr. Neha and Dr. Amit for pain medicine, Dr. Nishant for onco anesthesia and palliative care, Dr. Tanvir for pediatric anesthesia, and Dr. Ankur Khandalwal for neuro anesthesia. I also express my thanks to Mr. Rahul Chobe and Anesthesia TV for live streaming this webinar on the different portals of the Anesthesia TV. And finally, to my dear young IACNs. the yuva star i just want to say that doing a super position after anesthesiology and whichever stream of anesthesiology it's your own decision but you please choose it very carefully because it is your destination and once you reach there you ought to feel that you have found your love thank you very much i hand it back over to dr monica and dr nishant to carry forward the proceedings thank you very much thank you so much sir to begin with the first topic of the session so can you please allow me uh, screen share good thank you sir to begin with our first session uh, to begin with the session we the first topic is critical care medicine so we'll be discussing about the scope of critical care medicine and to discuss with that we have none other than the stalwart of critical care medicine Professor Sheila Nain Mehra, Professor of Anesthesiology and Critical Care at Tata Memorial Hospital, 
president uh, iscm as you all know and chair in critical care medicine committee of wfsa immediate past president all india difficult airway association first teacher for the dm critical care program in, in the country member of surviving sepsis campaign research committee and covid guidelines committee steering committee member of the asia pacific sepsis alliance and she is amongst the 14 international airway experts on asa difficult airway guidelines and puma guidelines she has developed a new test in hemodynamic monitoring called the tidal volume challenge she has delivered the william shoemaker oration at sccm 2023 in san francisco usa and she has been awarded fccm and ficcm by ic iscm her areas of interest include hemodynamic monitoring and airway management i welcome you ma'am and to speak on the topic to speak on the topic we have dr harish mm he is intensive care physician department of critical care medicine mazumdar shaw medical center narayan hrudayalay bangalore and he is graduated with honor of india's first medical council of india recognized dm in critical care medicine He has won Young Int Intensivist Award and many recognition certificates and grants, and he has organized many conferences and workshops in critical care medicine. Currently, he is training DRNB and IDCCM, IFCCM students in critical care medicine in his institute. His areas of interest include uh, uh, he, he has done MBA in hospital management and fellowship in infectious disease. Welcome, Dr. Harish. You can you. Uh, please start this uh, topic. You are able to see my slides. Yes. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Good evening, all. Uh, so maybe another ten, twelve minutes. I'll take you through career options in uh, critical care medicine after doing post graduation. That is anesthesia, either uh, DNB or MD anesthesia or DA DNB and all. So we have couple of options, good options in India. So one is DM in critical care medicine, which is a three year program with a proper thesis and all. Then again we have DRNB in critical care medicine. again the same curriculum uh, same kind of weightage with the thesis we need to do at the like during the course of the uh, drnb then we have indian society of critical care medicine which have an option of indian diploma in critical care medicine and indian fellowship in critical care medicine there are certain options from particular university particular institute uh, which opt some sort of fellowship in critical care medicine Our postdoctoral certificate course in critical care medicine. The duration may be one year, eighteen months, or two years, depending upon the university or maybe institution from where we are going to opt. So, need super specialty critical care medicine is one of the big options for anyone who is post MD or D, uh, like DNB anesthesia. We have around one uh, twenty DRNB critical care medicine seats. Like we have certain eligibility. specialties other than anesthesia like emergency medicine internal medicine pulmonology and chest medicine so the biggest thing what happened so this was the old pattern of like neat ss critical care medicine so we were having like with the background of anesthesia we were having like two super specialty option one may be related to anesthesia one is critical care medicine the beauty of the old pattern was we used to get like 40% of the questions from the feeder broad specialty which means for us the feeder broad specialty was anesthesia and 60% from the super specialty means we are opting for critical care medicine then so obviously we can guess okay so this 60% weightage of the questions is from properly from the critical care medicine then the preparation was very easy so then we can narrow down focus our preparation so that to get a good rank so that we can opt for our dream field that is critical care medicine in in one of the like appropriate college whether it is a dm or drnb critical care medicine so in the last year so all this confusion started with the introduction of new pattern of a uh, drnb need super specialty uh, like um, exam that is true for critical care medicine also so according to this neat ss exam pattern so they given around 150 questions uh, two and a half hour for uh, like that is about 150 minutes to attempt these questions 
So all the 150 questions would be from curriculum of the postgraduate exist level of the primary field or broad specialty subject. So what exactly it means? Like if you are from an anesthesia background, so you have an anesthesia pool means anesthesia to anesthesia. You can opt for neuro anesthesia, onco anesthesia, pediatric anesthesia and all. When it comes to critical care medicine, so you are going to fit into a like medicine feeder branch. So you are at par with the medicine background candidates. So your preparation need to be purely based on internal medicine questions. So you are like giving with the competition of a like people who done their general medicine, internal medicine, and they are opting for different super specialty courses other than critical care medicine also like so maybe DMR, DRN, the cardiology, neurology, endocrinology and all. So the paper remains same that is purely based on the internal medicine background. So this created so lots of problem. So in the last uh, uh, like NEET SS uh, like exam. So here if you see the exam scheme, so it is having 25% negative marking for incorrect answer. So no deduction of unattempted question. Suppose if you done a correct answer, four marks and incorrect answer carries 25% deduction that is minus one mark. So unattempted questions, zero mark. So this created like lots of problem when it comes to some sort of getting a cutoff or like factors which affect this result of the NEET SS new pattern. It depends upon the percentage cutoff of the entrance exam, the difficulty level of the examination, total number of seats available, number of candidates, who appeared for the examination, number of candidates who qualify for the NEET SS entrance examination. So here is the list of like DM critical care medicine. Now it's around 33 to 35 DM critical care medicine across all category of the hospital. Maybe it is a private institute. So some sort of like uh, autonomous institute or maybe a purely government institute and all. So lots of things varied in terms of some institutes have a bond you need to serve as a compulsory bond one year two year and all so there is a varied structure in terms of the fee when it comes to dm critical care medicine so the question here is is it really have an impact because of the new pattern of need in terms of the outcome so the students who had opted for new pattern of need super speciality in terms of their getting result and opting their dream branch of critical care medicine and its impact on the healthcare system in India so that we are going to take again at the end of the session and also think about it. So how it really have an impact when we are from the background of anesthesia when we opted for need super specialty branch. So then other than the need SS, we have other option for DM critical care medicine. So separate exam for AIMS, that is INICET, PJ and that of the GIPMAR. So it happens in two stage performance evaluation. See one is a written test carrying about 80 marks. So around 90 minutes, okay, 80 MCQs you need to like attempt, so which is carries some sort of negative marking and all. In the stage two, so if you are qualified with a 50th percentile or above, so then you are going to be shortlisted for a VIVA or interview. So that is a departmental clinical practical or lab based assessment, which is again having some sort of 20 marks here. They can ask anything related to your research, which you have done previously, your work pattern. So what's like some sort of specialized cases you manage, why you are having interest in critical care medicine, these kind of like why you are interview based questions, which carries the marks of around 20 marks. And then finally, they are going to announce the like rank. So depending upon that, so you can opt through the counseling for AIMS or PJ or that of the GIPMAR that is for DM critical care medicine. So other than this DRNB and DM, so we having this option Indian Diploma in Critical Care Medicine, one of the good option in the last couple of decades. So many of us got trained through Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. So this is the one year post MD or two year post diploma anesthesia. So it is a well structured program across corporate hospitals and all. So duration is one year for FCPS medicine candidates also. Like uh, it is having certain eligibility criteria other than anesthesia also those who are from MD medicine or maybe uh, general medicine. So MRCM, all these people can opt for this IDCCM after one year. So they need to like pass the both theory that is the MCQ based exit exam and that of the VIVA including the case presentation. It is having a very structure oriented 
exit exam evaluation including acls atls okay so cases uh, like ventilator graphics hemodynamic monitoring so drugs everything is been included in the exit exam assessment that is uh, idccm we have a huge list of like institute where we can opt for idccm across different tier 2 tier 3 cities in indian scenario so then once you finish idccm so that is for one year one more year you can opt for ifccm again it is a still robust training across all category of the clinical scenario including interventions including doing an echocardiography like uh, invasive procedures and all in an upgraded way so the eligibility is direct registration of ifccm for post md candidates will be accepted but such candidate should pass idccm prior to appearing for ifccm so the total duration idccm one year and that of the ifccm one year that is two year so again the exit exam is very well structured so including you have to face the critical appraisal of the paper end of life care ethical principles okay so quality indicators in icu research project how to do an auditing in intensive care unit so communication skills and all it is a very well appreciated very well structured exit exam so a bit tough to like clear if you don't have a optimal preparation both for theory and that of the practical session of the ifccm exam so next we have institution or university or a college run post doctoral certificate course or maybe fellowship programs in critical care medicine as i already told so the entry level is based on the interview so depending upon individual institute policy and all so the seats may vary from 2 to 4 the duration may vary from 1 year 18 months to like 2 years they are going to have their internal exam conducted so in a pre specified way and all so even couple of state universities also run 18 months even in, like karnataka rajiv gandhi university is having 18 months like uh, a PDCC, that is a postdoctoral certificate course, which is run across a couple of good corporate institutes and all. So again, this is a list of some hospitals uh, where they are conducting this PDCC or that of the fellowship program in critical care medicine. So again, when it comes to options outside India, so we have options in Australia, UK, okay, Canada, Singapore. And the last option is US. I'll tell why it is the last option with a background of anesthesia and all. When it comes to Australia, which is a total six year program. So basically, you need to clear Australian Medical Council uh, requirement. So ILTS is mandatory, like they ask for seven in all subcategory of the ILTS and 7.5 as an aggregate. Or nowadays they started accepting OET also. So it is either fellowship of the Royal Australian College of Physicians in Intensive Care Medicine or diploma of fellowship of the College of Intensive Care Medicine of Australia and New Zealand. So basically here, so if you are from an anesthesia background, so you need to undergo robust training in internal medicine first, then they narrow down your training to critical care medicine. So long duration in terms of the training session, so with a proper assessment in terms of exit exam and all. So it is a bit tough to enroll into FJFICM. So you need to start working there first, then you have to search for the vacancy, give the interview. So by that time, you have to be ready with the MC. So then you have to do lots of groundwork when you choose Australian method of training in critical care medicine and all. So next we have like jumping into uh, like United Kingdom. So how you can obtain like GMC registration okay, for entering into UK. So one age old method was clearing the plan. So that is a professional and linguistic assessment board exam. So currently it's not a very good lucrative option because you need to thoroughly prepare from the base of MBBS and all. So not worth it according to me. So after finishing your uh, like MD, we have other options and all. One option is suppose if you opt for European Diploma in Anesthesia and Intensive Care Medicine, means intensive care, that is part one and part two clear, you are straight away eligible to take this GMC registration. So since 2019, so those who cleared EDIAC and EDIC, that is like European Diploma in Intensive Care Medicine, you are eligible to get GMC registration easily. This is the easiest pathway to look into option in the UK. So if you opt for FRCA, again, uh, like FRCA primary, which is MCQ under the Viva or OSCE based, so more difficult exam than ADR. So, but the best way forward, if you are already working in UK, so there is something called MTI. So that is a medical training initiative eligible only for postgraduates 
having a minimum 3 years of training in anesthesia that is post md or post dnb so no exam needed so depending upon the vacancy you can opt for mta but remember for that also you need a gmc registration so the easiest way to get the gmc registration is edic or ediac okay so what exactly is this mta program so it is a medical training initiative so posts are offered for a period of 2 years okay so after that again you need to reapply if you wish to continue in uk so this is to work in anesthesia and our intensive care unit in uk remember in uk most of the institutes they have a peri operative care anesthetist only manages the intensive care but in the last decade they started having a dedicated separate units for intensive care training and intensive care management and all so provide evidence of at least 3 years within the last 5 years of anesthesia or intensive care medicine training outside of uk and european union that is a like bare minimal uh, qual- means uh, uh, qualification you require for mti so provide evidence of pg qualification acceptable to the college that is for the gmc registration and all as i told final frca so completed 30 months of training in anesthesia at least 18 months must be spent in approved post in uk or republics of ireland for international doctor a maximum of 12 months of overseas training in anesthesia combined with 6 months working in an approved uk post will be accepted it is bit tough so as compared to that of the mti post and all there is something called cesar training okay you have uh, gone through the mti post you done with edic and you got a gmc registration you jumped into uk so to become some sort of career option as a consultant in critical care medicine there is something called cesar which stands for certificate of eligibility for specialist registration and is the route to specialist registration for doctors who have not completed a gmc approved program but who are able to demonstrate that their specialist training qualification and experience are equivalent to the requirement of cct program that is certification of completion of training in the uk so basically so you are in the uk but you need to become like to become a consultant it takes around 8 to 10 years if you go through the cesar training so lots of paperwork it involves logbook you need to maintain if you show that professional efficiency then you are able to get a locum like consultant post in the critical care medicine a bit on edic so that is european diploma in intensive care medicine which happens in autumn session and that of the spring session so edic part 1 which is happening on september 26 2023 edic part 2 in november 21st and 22nd 2023 so in the part 1 so like it is an online exam in the post covid era otherwise previously the center used to be in kolkata in india otherwise you need to go to dubai for the like uh, nearest center and all so the mandatory requirement for edic part 1 is you require at least 12 to 18 months of icu training post post graduation so that is mandatory criteria you need one letter from your instituted or maybe your head of the department or senior consultant before you apply so exam is 3 hour under mcqs and each question trunk will have either four or five stems it is having a k type t type means t, uh, a type and all those things so a type questions one single best answer among five questions wrong or a blank answer equals to zero point so in the k type question four true or false statement in each question so half point for 3 out of 4 correct answer 1 point for all the four correct answer no negative answer so wrong answer do not subtract any of the total count okay so you need a proper preparation for edic part 1 some questions are case based some questions are like some sort of fact based questions definitely you need a preparation when you jump for edic part 1 which is an online based exam so edic part 2 exam again it is a post md you cleared edic part 1 so it is currently online okay so which is having a three clinical case scenario discussion and three computer based like section so where they are going to discuss on abg biochemistry ecg teg okay so or maybe some sort of hemodynamic monitoring curve pa catheter arterial line so icp monitoring curve so all these things are going to be discussed in terms of reading or interpretation in the edic part 2 with that of the three case scenario so the total duration is around 2 hours once you cleared both part 1 and part 2 so they are, offer you the edic cleared certificate based on that you can jump for opting for the like gmc registration and all so edic consists uh, sorry, of sorry dr harish sorry to interrupt yeah. Uh, yeah. we need to stick to the time yeah so i am winding so, up in two three slides yeah so last two slides so edic will also happen in two steps that is edic part 1 and part 2 again uh, 
like part one is a oral based so again part two is practical based including the viva and all so that is about the uk training option and all usa as i already told not a lucrative option with the background of anesthesia most of the critical care training so you need a internal medicine uh, training in usa before that you need to clear the usmle exam and all so again in singapore so you need to write to the particular institute the training duration is somewhere 12 to 24 months so again you need a ilts before you go to singapore for the training purpose and all canada there will be a waiting list of at least two years you need to write to particular institute one year duration is the training session so you need ilts to go for training in critical care medicine in canada also so this is for more information you can look for indian society of critical care medicine newsletter so in the last one year issue we detailedly discuss about overseas training in critical care medicine in between march 2022 to march 2023 with the leadership of uh, dr sheila nen metra so i am also one of the editorial board member so we written in detail about the options for overseas training in critical care medicine thank you thank you so much yeah um, thank you very yeah thank you very much uh, harish um greetings from uh, tata memorial hospital and also from the indian society of critical care medicine um it is indeed a great honor for me to be uh, chatting and discussing with uh, dr harish mm uh, dr harish if you can unshare your slides yeah uh, it's really a pleasure because uh, harish is as uh, already has been mentioned he is a first student of dm critical care in the country he's the first dm and uh, i became the first teacher because he became the first student and it was run by institute so harish has thereafter uh, been um, mentoring a lot of students in critical care medicine and i couldn't think of anyone better to talk about the various options and the curriculum available now in the interest of time i'll just uh, just ask harish two or three questions which can summarize the current situation as has already been alluded to by uh, dr navin you know a, a career in you know doing any kind of examination or a course in critical care medicine today in india has become a real challenge because of the current situation uh, with the neat ss exam that gives you entrance into dm drnb etc because uh, what has happened is that the exam exam uh, the uh, exam pattern has become that of the internal medicine exit exam which puts anesthesiologists at a real disadvantage because if you look at it critical care is one of the top preferences for anesthesiologists and for internal medicine students it is very low down on the list so here you have a specialty who wants to take in critical care but they are being put at a disadvantage and another specialty who doesn't really want it uh, but you know they uh, it's easier for them and that is why the ranking of the anesthesiologists has gone really down because of this examination pattern and as a result many seats in dm and dnb are vacant in the country so though dr navin has already said that we have lost the case and the student representation but uh, you know the since the president of the iscm uh, is an anesthesiologist i come from that specialty and along with the iscm we are once again going to represent not only to the ministry of uh, health and family welfare also to nmc and also get individual students uh, to write and represent us but in the meantime uh, you know we are stuck with this pattern right until some decision is made so what i want to ask you harish is that if you know as an anesthesiologist now with this current entrance exam being uh, you know the internal medicine exit exam portion how should an anesthesiologist who wants to take up a career in critical care in india and wants to do one of these courses how should they prepare so that is the need of the our see till uh, we get a case whatever uh, winning and all so we need to concentrate thoroughly on our preparation so basically my strong suggestion is uh, like when it comes to internal medicine so try to read hardcore internal medicine topics particularly immunology connective tissue disorder including sle rheumatology or maybe tuberculosis hiv these kind of questions you can't guess and you need a preparation again do you require to entirely start from maybe arison based critical means like internal medicine may not be required so there are narrow down mcq books you can concentrate on them so the rest of the things like there is a lots of overlap between a critical care medicine and that of the internal medicine maybe it is myocardial infarction pulmonary embolism cardiogenic shock septic shock tropical infection toxicology so those questions if you prepare based on critical care training or a critical care based preparation 
you can clear the exam so don't get discouraged by this like so called new pattern of the need so you need to restrategy restratify your preparation pattern that's it so that is my strong suggestion madam right. so uh, i mean definitely we are disadvantaged and we are fighting the case but until such time i'm sure we will evolve the way we are going to prepare and uh, you know i'm sure more and more anesthesiologists will start getting in even with this uh, you know though they have pulled the you know a finishing line further on for us um you know it's very unfortunate that critical care started as a specialty from anesthesia which stemmed out of anesthesia and today we have lost it uh, to you know the physicians the chest pulmonologists etc and people are actually questioning that uh, you know should anesthesiologists be doing intensive care at all and i think covid has put us at an advantage and it exposed that yes anesthesiologists are at the forefront of uh, critical care but having said that you know uh, we say we are anesthesiologists and we are intensivists now how true is that situation do you think as anesthesiologists we are really completely equipped to do intensive care so this question uh, answer is partially true you know, so because critical care medicine is a well established super specialty branch so partially true because like we uh, being a background of anesthetist we know the dynamicity so acute thinking when it comes to hemodynamics and that of the airway monitoring and airway management and all we are the best no doubt on that but critical care medicine is beyond that so when it comes to managing different specialty sub specialty super specialty cases and all maybe it's a gb syndrome myasthenia gravis and when we play around in and around drug resistant organisms we need a thorough in depth knowledge on the antibiotic antibiotic stewardship program infection control policies and all stroke management so definitely so answer is partially true so with the background of anesthesia we make the best intensivist no doubt on that but so to add on to that definitely we need a proper training in intensive care medicine uh, to call them ourselves as an intensivist with a qualified with a trained program and all you saying is we definitely are an advantage because of our primary specialty but critical care is beyond resuscitation and we have to strengthen our skills with diagnostics and management and you know in the interest of time i'll ask you one last question uh so a lot of people feel that you know critical care is it really a lucrative specialty because you know there's a lot of stress and you know as anesthesiologists you start a case you're not involved with the patient before during and then after you just leave but in critical care you're there throughout um you know the stress the working hours is it a lucrative specialty do we get as much respect as we would get uh with other specialties so what is your take on it you know what 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 can you tell of a yeah a person who wants to take a career in intensive care what can you say to attract that in other words so basically yes it's a lucrative option uh, with the background of anesthesia and all why uh, because during the training period so you might feel okay odd hours of duty post duty presentation mortality meeting this that and all but once you cleared your uh, like training session and you cleared your exit exam once you become a like associate or a junior consultant or a consultant uh it gives a very good lucrative option so in terms of the job openings like which are uh, throughout the corporate world corporate hospital everywhere they are looking for a qualified intensivist so both the medical legal perspective and to improve the outcome and all so again like you have a interaction with the patient patient relatives some sort of recognition you will get so certain institute like there are admission rights to an intensivist also they behave like a primary consultant so again in terms of the remuneration so good options once you uh, have a good qualification uh, background so job opportunities with a good remuneration with a like interaction with a recognition with a research uh, like what's happening in the last decade in intensive care and medicine if you see all these things definitely this is one of the lucrative option right okay thank you very much pa so you know true to our specialty that anesthesiologists are peri operative uh, clinicians you know that extends to critical care medicine and definitely this is a very attractive specialty gives a lot of in, uh, interest and especially people who have an interest in in medicine this is a very good specialty uh, and definitely our basic uh, anesthesia skills will help us uh, in this specialty and give us an advantage So with that I thank you very much uh, uh, Dr Harish and I thank Dr Navin and the cap team for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak on critical care medicine and interact thank, thank you Dr Sheila and uh, uh, we shall conclude by saying this that our struggle for uh, change getting back the change examination pattern reverted back to normal or some other way which is beneficial for anesthesiologists continues this year out of around 1000 
DM or DRNB seats line vacant, around 25% were of critical care, around 200 DRNB seats and 25 DM seats. And the representations with the ISA and ISSM have been working together, and the representations are going to the DGHS because Honorable Supreme Court has given these instructions to the Director General Health Services to find out a way why these super specialty courses are lying vacant. These prestigious seats should not lie vacant. So representations have been sent again to DGHS and NMC. But here I'll utilize this platform to request our younger lots, the budding critical care physicians, that court listens to the affected party. Court is soft towards the students, not so soft towards the associations. So the two associations have funded the court cases. You don't have to spend anything. Nowadays, you don't even travel also. Everything can be done online. So please do give representations to both ISA and ICCM that yes, we want that this revised pattern should be reverted back to the earlier one or to someone which is both suitable and unbiased for both medicine as well as anesthesiology candidates. And Dr. Sheila, there are one or two questions in the chat box. Monica will quickly put forward to you. And then I'll invite Dr. Aki Goel for the pediatric anesthesia. Over to you, Monica. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, ma'am, there are uh, two questions which uh, I think everyone uh, uh, is having in mind. So, what are the future prospects and scopes of uh, short courses like six months or one year or two years versus a complete three-year course of right. critical care? Uh, so, you know, I can tell you that before critical care was even recognized by the Medical Council of India as a specialty, the Indian Society of Ind uh, Critical Care Medicine was running the IDCCM course. And, uh, you know, we were training intensive. It's the first training in intensive care in the country came from I uh, ISCCM. So this is like I'm telling you, Harish was a first student. So that was the first time that MCI said that critical care is a specialty. Until then, it was not even recognized. So a lot of trained intensive. So this one year training and this is done in very high quality sites. So, you know, if someone says IDCCM, you know, even though it is a one year course or thing, it has a high value, even in someone in corporate um, hospitals and all when they say an IDCCM candidate, they recruit. So, so in terms of jobs and, you know, uh, this thing, it, it, it uh, is really good. Again, it depends. Sometimes anesthesiologists don't want a career in critical care, but they want a very good background in critical care because they're going to work in some hospitals where they also have to look after some post-op patients or they are looking at, you know, in a PACU or something where someone deteriorates. So they want to know how to manage a critically ill patient in ICU. So this kind of one year short course is really important. Another thing where it's very important is sometimes people are not sure, should I do a career in critical care? So just straight away jumping into doing DM critical care, even if they can qualify and they may get it, it may not be a good thing. So I know a lot of students who do this one year of IDCC or short courses, PDCC and decide whether this is the career they really want to do or even, even for getting jobs. So both ways, I think this uh, helps as a launching pad. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, another question is, what are the prerequisites of opening uh, own ICU setup after doing TM? Right. So that is quite a challenge. I've trained a lot of uh, my students have now DM critical care and they are in the government hospitals, in the corporate hospitals. Some of them are even freelancing. So, uh, you know, looking at not only with DM critical care, but if you look, see, uh, you know, there's an acute shortage of intensivists in the country. And uh, if you look at many, you know, in the metros and all, we have a lot of people, there's a lot of competition. But in the smaller places, there's lack of trained intensivists. Many places is just an anesthesiologist or a physician doing critical care. So, uh, you know, a lot of scope even for this, for someone to have a private uh, setup or even an ICU or even freelance intensivists. That is also very, very popular where different hospitals or even setting up teams. They have teams where they uh, provide critical care services to different, different hospitals. That model is also there. Very popular in cities like Hyderabad or even people going, uh, you know, to certain ICUs to see the patient they are called, you know. So the ICU or the nursing home is run by somebody, but they call the intensivist like you would call a pulmonologist or you would call another uh, super specialist. So all these are very much in uh, demand and the anesthesiologist is in a perfect position to not only lead, but in also to coordinate these activities and to be part of this kind of uh, team. Uh, Ma'am, basically, our own setup as in patients can be admitted under the intensivist or uh, a person from some other speciality. Yes. No, anesthesiologists are very much able to do intensive care. In fact, anesthesiologists are now running OPDs. 
when you are an intensivist in a corporate hospital they even have their opd so we have a lot of post anesthesia once you discharge the patient the patient comes back to you you run the opd so this gives you know otherwise in many hospitals uh, you know we are not given rights to uh, admit patients directly anesthesiologists are not allowed to sit in an opd and see patients other than maybe pre op checkup or something like that so this has really increased the value of the anesthesiologist in the a uh, corporate setup because you know a post anesthesia a post icu care is a very integral part of corporate hospital many corporate hospitals who provide this specialty are really looked up to oh you have so instead of going back to their primary physician they come to the icu doctor in fact very often they say okay i'm discharged can we come back and see you you know so who better could guide them on their future course than the intensivist so i think there are lot of avenues this is an exciting new area and that is this is definitely something you know very promising and i think anesthesiologists are in the best place to do critical care this is my belief and my experience thank you so much ma'am but this we move on to our next topic thank you thank you dr sheila and dr harish thank you very much thank you thank you i'll take a leave thank you so uh, after a very uh, informative session about on uh, critical care by dr harish mm and dr sheila mantra mm uh, i would like to uh, move on to the next topic uh, equally important topic uh, that is of pediatric anesthesia branch and for this i would like to invite a chairperson dr geeta nath mm uh, could you please share the uh, dr monica yeah dr Dr. Geeta Nath, ma'am, is a consultant in anesthesia and intensive care, Exxon Anesthesia Associates, Hyderabad, Rainbow Children's Hospital, and Bright Bright. Previously, professor of anesthesia, CMC Bellore. Her major achievements are ACLS, CCLS, FCCLS, FCCS, and CDLS instructor, module editor for PACT, Vast Country Coordinator, ex-president ISA Hyderabad, ex-president AAPA Telangana. Her areas of interest are pediatric and obstetric anesthesia. of thelmic anesthesia regional anesthesia difficult airway management ultrasound and anesthesia and intensive care we welcome you ma'am and to speak on this topic i would like to invite panel dr rakhi goel ma'am she is the director anesthesia mathukar rainbow children's hospital new delhi head of clinical services rosewalk by rainbow hospital new delhi her ma- major achievements are director fellowship program pediatric and obstetric anesthesia national executive member of aapa founder secretary aapa delhi chapter associate editor of joacp director wfsc safe pediatric anesthesia faculty asian society of pediatric anesthesia ppls course so i would request dr rakhi gul ma'am to please start with the presentation thank you dr tanvir and thank you dr navin and the cap series uh, for uh, this opportunity uh being a, a speaker on pediatric anesthesia i'll keep it to pediatric small dr harish has covered a lot intensive care some lot of things are common like he talked about gmc and you know details about each thing so i'll keep it short and i'll keep more time for uh, maybe discussion let me share my uh mm, Sindhi mm-hmm. is uh, not letting me share. You have to unmute. Yeah, now I can. Just please confirm if you can see. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so, Dr. Geeta and I both represent uh, Rainbow Children's Hospital, and we take pride in talking about pediatric anesthesia. uh because in our country we feel that there is still a need uh, for uh, realization like dr maitra said how difficult it was to make people understand the need so uh same for pediatric you know the need for a separate specialty called pediatric anesthesia that need is uh, more uh, relevant now because uh, the parents especially the young parents they're quite aware they are very scared when it comes to their uh, 
tiny ones getting uh, operated or in the ICU. They have uh, tons of questions. You know, so there is a need and we need to have a specialized care. With that in mind, I uh, would tell you a few things about the career options. So this is uh, when you ask why you should do pediatric anesthesia, I feel to me, this is the reason, you know, a bunch of kids uh, whom, with whom you can play, you can have fun and yet do your work. And, you know, it's so gratifying to see their smiles, their parents smiles at the end of the day. So this is the driving force of pediatric anesthesia. And it's a very strong driving force, I would say, to take it as a career. So, you know, why pediatric anesthesia besides this? Uh, there are two reasons. One, you want a full-time career in pediatric anesthesia or as a primary uh, career in pediatric anesthesia. Second, which I think is more common in our uh, fraternity is uh, see, during your post-graduation, your exposure in the pediatric OT was limited. Especially now when we have fellowships and DMs, uh, the PGs don't get a chance to spend enough time or do enough especially decision making in the pediatric theaters. So, you know, when they come out of MD, even SRship, they feel uh, inadequate. You know, when I take fellowship interviews, this is the commonest thing. I ask them why you want to do it. So they feel I'm still scared to handle a kid, you know. So as an anesthetist, we can't be scared of handling any human of any size. So I, I think there are various reasons uh, on an individual basis that uh, drive you towards specialized training. And, and one should do it so that you're not scared of anything anymore. Now, another question, when should you get, when is a good time to get extra training in pediatric? I think you should... Invest a couple of years doing um, anesthesia for adults. Get your hands, uh, you know, get a grip uh, in adults and then come to pediatric. Because pediatric is tricky. It's delicate. The margin of safety is less. So a little experience in the field of anesthesia, I would recommend. So do, I wouldn't recommend that just finish your post-graduation and jump in for a fellowship. Do a couple of years and then come. And then the question, when you've come for fellow, uh, for a training in pediatric anesthesia, for how long should you train? So that, again, we go back to uh, the various options and the reasons why you want to train. You know, you want to train for a full time, you do a DM, you want to train, you know, just to complete your spectrum, you train less. So we'll come to that. So what options do you have? One is the DM. It's like all other DMs, it's three years, it's a standardized course. Then you have recently introduced FNB, which is conducted by the NBE, and this is for two years. Rest of the fellowships are by and large one year duration. We'll come to each one. So you have to decide how much training you need, depending on what your futuristic goals are. Is it one year, two years, three years? Obviously, in one year, you will learn something which is limited and also depends on the center from which you are uh, you know, getting trained. And DM is a full, full on three year course where you do everything, you learn everything, you do everything hands on and you are ready as an independent pediatric anesthetist. Now, uh, DM is not a very old course. Uh, now, only in, there are two centers in the entire country that are uh, accredited for a DM pediatric anesthesia. It started with KEM Mumbai. It has two seats. Uh, this is under national board. And you have to take the NEET SS exam by the national board to qualify for the seats at KEM Mumbai. Now, right now, uh, the same, the, uh, Dr. What Harish, Dr. Harish told you about the NEET SS exam, you know, the details. Um, the same whole good. Here, uh, as yet, there is no defined curriculum by the National Board, but it is, it's evolving and will soon have. Now, the other center is uh, PGI Chandigarh. Now, this is affiliated with the National Medical Council. This is not NDE. This is, again, three years. And here they take uh, twice a year, they take candidates. 
you know, in January and July. So there are two sessions and the um, uh, eligibility is post MD or uh, DND, but there is an entrance exam, which is uh, conducted by PGI Chandigarh. It's a computer-based exam. Uh, it's held twice uh, a year and it has negative marking, you know. So if you aim so, so DM at two places, the entrance is different at different times of the year. So it's best advised that you go on the uh, website of these two institutes and see what works best for you. You know, as far as the um, exam is concerned, the timing of the exams, the number of seats. And they take, uh, like PJ Chandigarh, I personally know, they take sponsored seats from the armed forces, from the railways. So, you know, uh, getting there as an open um, category may be challenging, but then uh, you should keep your options open and see what best fits in. Uh, now, uh, FNB, uh, this has just started and this is a two years program by the National Board. The entrance exam is FET, uh, Fellowship Entrance Exam, which is a merit-based uh, counseling uh, by the NDE. And uh, these are the hospitals. There's a list of hospitals across the country. And I mentioned the number of seats that they have been uh, allotted. Where, uh, sorry. Now, this program is just beginning. These institutes have just been accredited and the program is just starting. So uh, it's uh, the curriculum, the how it's going to happen, what at the end of it, how the students or, or the residents are going to come out is yet to be seen. But I'm sure a two years program will give you enough uh, uh, exposure, hands on training to be uh, very confident to handle uh, um, children, young infants and neonates. Now, uh, you know most of it about the FET uh, exam. There's a part one and a part two of it. Here, um, 50th percentile is the qualifying, is the cutoff. So rest would depend on the availability of seats. You know, And the best part is there is no upper or lower age limit. So this uh, you can do later. As I said, you may not jump in and go in for uh, FNB in pediatric anesthesia immediately after post-graduation compared to other subspecialities in anesthesia. Here you can wait, you can, you know, work uh, and then come in. Uh, now, most uh, the DM and the FNB, the curriculum is, uh, it covers the perioperative anesthetic management of children of all ages. It covers neonatal resuscitation. It also covers intensive care in pediatric uh, ICUs and in neonatal ICUs. But one part which is institutionally, uh, you know, dependent on the institution is the pediatric cardiac and the new. Because we have in our country a bit of overlap. Uh, pediatric cardiac is also done by... Uh, those who go for three years cardiac anesthesia, they do pediatric cardiac. At the same time, we have one year fellowship of pediatric cardiac anesthesia in certain centers. But if you ask me whether uh, you will learn pediatric cardiac anesthesia during your uh, pediatric anesthesia fellowship, uh, I wouldn't say a big yes. If you take interest, if your institute uh, has enough time to spare you to cardiac OTs? Uh, yes, but usually not. So uh, when you are looking, uh, when you're comparing with overseas fellowship there, mostly pediatric cardiac is a part of pediatric anesthesia fellowship. I think this is something that we should uh, know and accept till it changes in our country as well. Now, the most uh, popular, the most uh, taken fellowship uh, so far has been, has been for many years is the Indian Association of Pediatric Anesthesia Fellowship Program. This is a one-year program and 12 institutes right now are accredited throughout the country. Any MD or DNB can uh, take this, um, you know, can apply. 
there is uh, no common entrance exam but the centers that are accredited they uh, some take their own exam and interview and some take just the interview and they select candidates for this fellowship program the stipends for this one year fellowship is also not fixed it is as per the institutional policy so if you're doing in a government mostly it is equivalent to an sr senior resident if you're doing in a corporate setup it depends on the city it depends on the institution now some institutions do charge fellowship fees at the time of admission some do not uh ipa as an association has started charging a nominal fees for both admission and for the exit exam now the exit exam is important and it's centrally conducted by the ipa uh at the end of one year and the best part about this fellowship is their regular classes which are online their master classes and there is a lot of uh, theory which is taught to you uh by the association so even if the individual center is not able to take individual classes you are like loaded with classes and and at the end of it you are really good to go this is uh, just a list of uh, all the institutes that uh, where you can do an ipa one year fellowship program uh, they are all across the country and each one is better than the other now besides is, these ipa sorry, fellowships can i stick to the yeah. time sorry ma'am <laughs> yeah, sure thank you sure i'll i'll uh, be faster so lot of institutes i've just named a few there are lots of institutes under uh, various universities where they have this one year pdcc or institutional fellowships they are under universities even wfsa has a six months fellowship uh, program in mumbai gangaram has one uh, ica has one you know so there are a lot of fellowship programs now overseas fellowships you can do in the us canada uk australia singapore these are the popular ones uh as dr harish mentioned anything in us you need us mle anything in uk you need gmc uh registration but the best part about the uk fellowship is that there are lots of institutes they sponsor you for gmc registration so you need not have edac you need not have frca for those centers there's a list of centers on the net you can check where your fellowship uh, your gmc can be sponsored by the uh trust you know so uh an ilts is of course necessary for all uk australia and singapore institutes now should freelancers be doing uh, pediatric anesthesia uh, uh, without training absolutely not i would say because you know safety is more important than just doing the case and if they are doing any training how much is enough this is a very tricky uh thing and we do not recommend that children be doing children to be uh you know anesthetized or perio care of children in uh, as a freelancing uh if you are in an institute and you regularly do not do pediatric anesthesia and one or case if you are doing some level of training is definitely required and you should that training would teach you that which case you should do should you be doing a simple simple looking case like a tonsil i wouldn't recommend you know most of us wouldn't recommend they can be really tricky in asa one child can get you in real trouble so stay out of it because safety is more important than your credentials than your the money you're making now uh, after having uh, trained in pediatric anesthesia uh, people think of a career path now uh, there are uh, options uh, but the you know something that is more than usual are these mother and child setups in the country and you know just like the west they that concept is now in great demand and we have and they're well paying and you know you are doing uh, primarily what you intend to do so you must uh, explore these uh, mother and child uh, facilities or pure children private hospitals if you are looking at a flourishing career in pediatric anesthesia now this is just a you know a flyer where this is how you can apply and 
go ahead with the fellowship programs. It's easy and doable and in great demand. So, and anyone who wants to know more, uh, you know, can are free to contact me or Dr. Geeta, and we can tell you more because now we are limited with time. So, no, I won't go further. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paki, for a very clear elucidation uh, uh, of you know what options are there for pediatric anesthesia and all that. So, as you say, the main choice. If you are interested in pediatric anesthesia, is are you going to become just a pediatric anesthetist, or are you going? Are, do you want some supplementation of your training so that you can manage basic pediatric cases where, wherever you're working? So um, again, that is a choice based on what is available and uh, what you want to do. And as um, I had put up in that flyer, you just showed our fellows, when they leave after, even after one year training, they become so confident. See, uh, intubation is one thing. Intubation is the science, but extubation is an art. And extubation is often is where people get into trouble. So they, they leave our fellowship with so much confidence. So I feel really happy to uh, have trained all these people and, you know, made them safe um, anesthesiologists. And as you say, uh, freelancing, we were talking about yesterday, freelancing is a place where people can get into trouble. So I would suggest that anybody who does freelancing pediatric anesthesia, take somebody with you because two heads are better than one. So um, we are happy to answer any questions. Uh, uh, Rakhi, do you want to add anything else? No, I'm good, ma'am. I'm good. Yeah, um, yeah. There are two questions in the chat box, rather three. One has been already answered. Uh, since pediatric anesthesia is a high pressure job, is it that rewarding both financially as well as professionally? So I think. So, Raki, you want to answer? Yes, yes, yes. Of course, it's rewarding. You know, uh, professionally, it's extremely rewarding. I mean, uh, I feel that if I can handle kids, I can handle anyone. And uh, prof and uh, financially, of course, uh, I can't uh, complain. <laughs> so the, the other thing is you spoke about the mother and child centers. I feel, Dr. Naveen, that we could have added obstetric anesthesia as one of the topics because really it is so important, so necessary for uh, so many mothers deliver all the time and their safety is so uh, important. So I think, uh, you know, we should I think that's evolving. The concept of mother and child is evolving. For and I think in the time, next we have series, to leave out transplant yes. also, and, and uh, there are many other fields. So I would yeah. say that both these specialties are very fulfilling, technically challenging, academically satisfying, and psychologically, you know, <laughs> emotionally fulfilling for for both of us, right, Rakhi, and for all of us in uh, pediatric anesthesia. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there's another question that if I do DM pediatric anesthesia or fellowship, can I get a good job as number of pediatric cases is generally less in hospitals? So, I think you need to go to a pediatric hospital. If you've got a DM in pediatric anesthesia, uh, or you go. And this is the. Yeah, yeah exactly. This is the problem with all DMs. When you compare any DM with a fellowship program, the same question crops up. Uh, will I get, you know, if it's a three-year course, will I get three times a one-year fellowship? That doesn't happen. It's about what you can deliver. You know, it's not the number of uh, years multiplied by some X money. X money. Yeah. So, so what you can deliver, of course, uh, a DM would probably be a better uh, pediatric anesthetist and maybe paid better. But are there enough uh, places who are going to pay that much? That much uh, I can't say yes to that. Yes. But they can go into the teaching line for pediatric anesthesia with a DM uh, in pediatric uh, anesthesia. They can be, you know, as part of our teaching faculty, they can yes. join us. 
So with that, uh, I think it's uh, it was a very informative session, Dr. Raki, ma'am, Dr. Geeta Nath, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Over to Naveen, sir. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Geeta Nath, so ma'am, and Dr. Raki. Goel. It was a pleasure interacting with you. So okay. I hand it over back to Dr. Deepika for starting the session on cardiac anesthesia. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raki, Dr. Geeta Nath. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Good evening, everyone. We will be beginning with our next session, Career Options After Post-Graduation in the Speciality of Cardiac Anesthesia. It is an absolute honor to introduce the chairperson for the session who indeed doesn't need any introduction, Dr. Deepak K. Tempe, sir. Dr. Tempe, sir, please start your video. Sir is a senior professor and head officiating vice chancellor ILBS deemed to be University of New Delhi. It would be appropriate to state that he knows it all. His excellence, expertise and skills in the field of cardiac anesthesia are beyond perfection. And it won't be wrong to state that the word cardiac anesthesia and Dr. Deepak K. Tempe sir goes hand in hand. His, indeed, the list of his achievements are, are never ending and beyond enumeration. However, to state a few, he is a Dr. B.C. Roy Awardee, ex-director professor at G.B. Panth Hospital, ex-dean Molana Azad Medical College, New Delhi, ex-chancellor Indian College of Cardiac Anesthesia, is a lifetime achievement awardee, recipient of honorary FRCA and has got the best teacher award. It is a moment of gratitude to have you, sir, as a chairperson for this session. And to speak on the topic, we have an esteemed speaker for the topic, Dr. Rakesh Arya. Dr. Rajesh Arya is a consultant cardiac anesthesiologist, Hero DMC Heart Institute, Ludhiana, Punjab. He has got many board certifications in perioperative transesophageal echocardiography. Japanese Board, European Board, NBE USA, Honorary FTE by ACTA Fellowship, American Society of Echocardiography. He has taken more than 100 national and 25 international faculty guest lectures. He has got more than 25 national and 10 international publications in index journals, has conducted 15 national and 6 international TE workshops. He has got a chapter in the book on transesophageal echocardiography on, in recent advances in cardiothoracic surgery. He is a re registrar at Indian College of Cardiac Anesthesia and is a teacher and examiner for FIECTA and FTEE course. We are grateful to have you, sir, to speak on the topic and I would like to begin with your presentation, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, you are muted. Dr. Arya, unmute yourself. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Naveen, for starting this initiative. And uh, I hope you can see my screen. Is my screen visible to all? Uh, not yet, sir. Not yet. Okay. Uh, I'll uh, stop it and share it again. I think my system is... Uh, There's some, some issue in this. Just, just hold on for a second. I'll just uh, take care of this technical hitch, which usually doesn't happen. In the meantime, I uh, request Dr. Tempe sir to say a few words. By yes. that time, Dr. Arya settles with the slides. And Dr. Tempe sir, please. It's an honor to have you on board, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Naveen. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. So I, I have been listening very patiently to the previous two topics on pediatric anesthesia and critical care. And my views on this subject, I have uh, written in the chapter in the Miller's Anesthesia 7th and 8th edition under the title uh, as International Scope of Anesthesia Practice in India. So most of my views are uh, published there. And also I have given the details of, of seats and of kind of training that is available in various specialties or, or super specialties in this country. I want to make a few statements. Number one, that uh, you should take up a job that gives you work satisfaction. That is number one. Money should be secondary. And uh, if, after all, wh why do we work? We work for making our livelihood. Yes. 
So, but if you can get your earn your livelihood by doing the work that gives you satisfaction, that is most important. So, if critical care gives you satisfaction, you can do that. If pediatric uh, anesthesia gives you satisfaction, you can do that. If cardiac anesthesia, uh, very challenging. If you try to take up challenges in your life, the satisfaction is even more. So, critical care and cardiac anesthesia, and so is pediatric anesthesia, are very challenging. And if you uh, want to fulfill challenges uh, and earn the sense of satisfaction, then these are the specialities. Uh, the money is secondary and uh, in this regard, I would like to say that uh, I do not encourage uh, nursing home practices or on-call practices or freelancing because there is no comparison of institutional practice to that of uh, freelancing or other practice. Eventually, as you might have noticed, most of you, that all these smaller nursing homes are being, you know, captured by the corporate or bigger hospitals. So that all types of uh, patient care is available under one roof. And yeah, if, you, if you work in this kind of specialty, then this kind of hospital, the, the kind of satisfaction that you will get will be much better than what you would otherwise gain. The third thing I want to say is that... Uh, uh, the other thing I wish to say is about the about the uh, money part I have covered. The yes, do not insist on specialized or qualified people. If you want to know as to how many cardiac anesthetists are required in our country, I hope the, the data will be presented by Dr. Rajesh. Or if uh, the number of critical care specialists that are required, if you want to fill up that gap with qualified people then it is going to take, take at least 50 years, at least 50 years, maybe more, maybe 100 years. So we have to allow people who are less qualified or less experienced, but have interest and some experience in that specialty to work. No doubt the DM cardiac anesthetist is better equipped, better qualified, better knowledgeable than a person who has only some experience of about a year or so in cardiac anesthesia. But you will never be able to fulfill the gap of the total number of cardiac anesthetists that are required in our country. To give a recent example of COVID, in Delhi government, we trained 5,000 non-ICU doctors, nurses and paramedics to in preparation to deal with the third COVID. And every other country did that because most other countries uh, do not have shortage of specialized people to in, in their day-to-day -day practice, but in India, if you insist that I need a DM cardiac anesthetist to anesthetize the patients undergoing cardiac surgery, that will not be fair. I will give you an example of uh, uh, one court case. Uh, while I was the dean, a case was referred to me because there was a complaint by a patient that his patient who was admit, his relative was admitted in the intensive care unit. He developed pneumonia and his pneumonia was treated by an uh, anesthetist, whereas it should have been treated by a pulmonologist. That was his contention. So the court sent the matter to me asking me what is the correct answer in this scenario. Who should have treated the pneumonia? So I called an anesthesiologist, a pulmonologist and a physician to take their views on the subject. And believe me, everyone said that they are the best persons to treat the pneumonia. Now if I had sent a reply that the pulmonologist is the best person to treat this pneumonia, then I think 90% of the ICUs in this country would have to close down because we don't have so many pulmonologists. Neither do we have intensivists, so many. Neither do we have the physicians who are interested in doing critical care or who will visit the or manage the pneumonia in the critical care. After all, what is pneumonia and what expertise, expertise does it require to treat pneumonia? Don't you think any, any, any MBBS doctor is capable of treating pneumonia if he knows the subject well. It's a question of giving some bronchodilators, some antibiotics to be aware about the culture sensitivity and carrying out some good bronchial lavage and things like that. So we as specialists, whatever may be our specialty, I know that we love our specialty. We want that we, we are the best in our specialty. That is true. But please do not disallow other people who are serving the people across the country because you cannot reach at every place in your country. So I think Rajesh is uh, yes, ready sir. with this presentation yes. and we will like to hear him.
Okay. <laughs> good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. And all the participants on board and uh, online at uh, any place around India or outside. Um, uh, I regret for the technical hitch. This is probably the first time since COVID we started online meeting it that has happened to my system. Probably it needs time to change now. Uh, thanks to Dr. Naveed. Uh, interesting topic and uh, very pertaining to the young people. So if I uh, look for the journey of cardiac anesthesia, we started from conscious, conscious sedation, uh, segmental blocks, regional blocks, general anesthesia, and finally we came to the subspecialty. I don't call it as a super specialty. I always call it as a subspecialty of anesthesia, that is neuropediatric, conco, critical care, pain, and and of course uh, cardiac anesthesia as a subspecialty of uh, the major uh, the parent anesthesiology. Uh, what is so special about cardiac anesthesia? Well, why why we talk about it? Uh, if you see uh, in a in a layman's word. Uh, uh, opinion. When we anesthetize a person, person in general anesthesia, entire body is anesthetized. I mean, we take care of all other senses are depressed by our drugs with controlled uh, by, by the anesthetist, except the heart. The heart is working continuously throughout general anesthesia. But in cardiac anesthesia, and uh, when we are going on pump and we are doing an open heart surgery, we need to stop that also. So that is a major difference about another specialty or another subspecialties of general anesthesia uh, and the cardiac anesthesia. So we need to learn the extracorporeal circulation. As we you know, we take the blood out and, uh, and uh, uh, change the gases and push it back. So extracorporeally, we have to manage the heart and the lung of the patient. And uh, uh, to do that, we need a lot of uh, advanced cardiac monitoring, advanced respiratory monitoring, now neurological monitoring, and combination of all these things and uh, and the knowledge and the expertise on the pump also that that makes uh, a specialized uh, training which we call as cardiac anesthesia uh, what are the training modules uh, i i'll restrict my my presentation to within uh, 7 8 minutes as directed by <laughs> sir that we should uh, not exceed so there are national medical council that nmc is conducting the dm courses which are at the institutes uh, government and private uh, medical colleges that they are uh, run by the individual universities under the umbrella of NMC. The National Board of Examination started the DNV super specialty course uh, and the entrance is through the NEET. The NMC DM course is there are around 100 seats all over India. And uh, if you see the DNV seats, there are around 50 seats. So there are 150 seats which are which are filled by through NEET exam uh, at the entrance exam. And after that day, three years course, they take the exit exam and they are uh, recognized by the government, by the statutory bodies as the cardiac anesthesiologist. Other than that, there are the deemed universities which are running the certificate courses. Uh, Indian Association of Cardiac Anesthesia started in 1997, a robust society, one of the uh, second or third best society of cardiac anesthesia in the world. And the only society other than the American which publish an index journal on cardiac anesthesia. We have got fellowship courses, that is uh, fellowship in cardiac anesthesia, we call it FIACTA. And the fellowship in transesophageal eco or echocardiography, now more more or less now uh, we call it FTE. And there, other than these, there are certain PDCC that is post doctorate certificate course, post MD certificate course of one year or so. They are run by the government institutes also still, and many places they are run by the private or the deemed universities. So these are the training and the teaching which is right now offered to the candidates who pass their MD exam. Uh, uh, and after MD, they are offered these things in India that you can pursue the cardiac anesthesia program or uh, training through these courses. Uh, what we expect from the cardiac anesthetist, if you see broadly, uh, they're long working hours because the, the surgery goes sometime overnight or some uh, in any length of the time. Uh, we need to manage the patient in ICUs because cardiac anesthetists and post-operative cardiac patients and even pre-operatively when they are on a pump or ventilator or those, so we are supposed to treat them on ICU, in ICU. Uh, we need to be part of the cath lab procedure and anesthetist has to be present in cath lab, maybe even uh, for any stenting and anything because the, the, the cardiac event doesn't give you much time. Whenever there is anything goes wrong, within few minutes, you have to handle the situation that the heart is working and oxygen is delivered to the tissues. So to, to uh, bridge that uh, response time, the anesthetist is supposed to be in the cath lab. And there are a lot of cardiac emergencies and quick responses ex expected from a cardiac anesthetist. Uh, cardiac anesthetist has to have a good knowledge of ultrasound because 
uh, ultrasound is what you give uh, gives the diagnosis when you are stuck in a situation when the hemodynamics are not giving the correct diagnosis the ultrasound gives you the answer now the ecmo and advanced cardiac procedures like lung transplant heart transplant uh, uh, transcatheter procedures mm -hmm. like tavi wall replacement uh, device closures everything all these needs an expertise on the hand of the person standing on the head and of the patient that is cardiac anesthetic to so know what is going happening and the, how to handle the situation if something goes wrong and most of the cardiac patients after surgery they are post op ventilated and and uh, we uh, we we handle the patients range from a, a newborn to to any age group uh, for for all uh, i mean the patient with a newborn may have a cardiac disease and uh, emergency you have to do a balloon aortic volvotomy or any any procedure same way the person at the last stages when he comes to the hospital uh, you have to do some some cardiac procedure to to keep him alive so the the age is not a limit for a cardiac anesthetic he is in working in the pediatric as well as geriatric career options uh, cardiac anesthetic specialists are required at the government and other private institutes government now for a person to join a government institute or a university recognized uh, hospital where there is a teaching program uh one is expected to have a dm or uh, uh, a drnb course in cardiac anesthesia corporate hospitals they mostly require some some certification like dm dnb or pdcc with experience private hospitals it's a private hospital more than the certification they need experience of the person they are more concerned with the patient handling which a specialist can 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 perform and private medical college they need some some sort of certification so that they can start the the courses in their institute so these are the career options broadly speaking about cardiac anesthesia uh, coming to the quantum of the surgery cardiac surgery was very primitive initially it started in uh, mid uh, 90s uh, worldwide in india the spurt came in uh, late 80s with the eco and everything uh, it came in 90s now if you see overall the cardiac surgery profile is increasing and same way we people have to cope up with the cardiac surgeons uh and our specialty is increasing as well we are developing new techniques new technologies and new medicines and everything so yeah, this is the paper i just got it uh, i was reviewing the literature in uh, uh, in 2017 this is paper published from pakistan and is published in indian heart journal which says that there were around 150000 open heart surgeries in india and the the numerical numbers are given in the surrounding countries and compared to that the approximate surgeons in india in that time was 1891 and if we say that around 150 uh, cardiac anesthetists are being uh, 200 around are produced every year so 17 to 22 say 100 more so that way the number of uh, people uh, number of cardiac anesthetists produced every year and and uh, if i compare the number of operations uh, uh, happening every year 1.150000 the now the um, quantum is around uh, 2 2.2 lakh operations per year and if you multiply add to the cath lab procedures also the cath lab procedures will be around uh, double the number of cardiac surgeries so the cardiac surgery is increasing day by day probably because of the medical insurance coming into practice because all complicated operations tavi is a routine procedure at most of the places now heart transplant you will every every month we listen that this hospital has started heart transplant heart transplant in uh, every part of the country so the cardiac surgery is a growing specialty and if the cardiac surgery is going to specialty even the demand for cardiac anesthetic is, is also growing day by day coming next to that uh, training and hand on hands on training and uh, uh, teaching uh, teaching uh, i would say that iit has taken a lead in uh, teaching way before the uh, universities or uh, nmc that time uh, medical council of india and uh, national board before that we had already started our uh, training teaching program uh, we were conducting the fellowship exams uh, apart from the training teaching uh, i mean in, within the classroom uh, one needs to have a good good uh, expertise in uh, handling patient that is hands on training we do conduct a te workshop which is international now since last uh, 17 18 years Uh, one in Medanta, Delhi, and one is in Bangalore. That is, those two are recognized by uh, our association. We have got a cardiac anesthesia CMEs around the calendar. You will find one or two CMEs every every month are happening in any part of the country. Uh, the hemodynamic monitoring workshops are being conducted by cardiac anesthesia societies. IACT has got uh, some fourteen regional branches, state, city, or regional branches. They are doing their conferences and. 
um, uh, training programs. Uh, then online webinars have been started by ACTA every fortnightly, which have been attended by I, all the DM, DNB, FIACTA, all, all fellows. They they are uh, con attending around uh, around 80, 90 candidates um, uh, attend every year with the experts present there. Uh, the ACTA Eco Library is a uh, symbolic of learning eco around the world, and I'm happy that uh, with the guidance of Tempesar, my little effort of mine and my colleague. We have got 4,500 members uh, of uh, IACTA Eco Library worldwide. And uh, it's, it's a, I think, the right platform to tell if you go anywhere in the world, wherever there is cardiac surgery, and you tell we are from India, they'll talk about the IACTA Eco Library. It's come on the, it's approved by the ISCCM to be on their website. It's already on the Brazilian society websites. Nepal, Nepalese societies has agreed. Pediatric societies has agreed. Uh, South Africa has agreed. Uh, the Cardiac Surgeon Society already has that our IACTA or our association's eco library on their website. So that the eco library has become a symbolic of uh, learning and uh, teaching eco, and it is absolutely free. Even I am in con conversation with Dr. Naveen earlier uh, that it should come on the ISA website so that all the ISA members can can join it and enjoy it and learn it over there. Uh, if we if I come to demand and supplies, the quantum of cardiac surgery is on uprise. It is expected to multiply in five to seven years. When the cardiac surgery multiplies in India, the demand for cardiac surgeons, demand for cardiac anesthetists, demand for cardiac nurses, demand for perfusionists, it will go up parallel to the to the supply. The number of hospitals operating cardiac uh, performing cardiac surgery is increasing every day. Number of cath labs is multiplying in every seven five seven years. Number of anesthetists taking cardiac anesthesia course is still limited to just one fifty or two hundred a year. So, so there is a lot of, lot of demand generating every year, but uh, number of seats available are less. Probably government is planning to in, improve uh, the gap between the demand supply and supply is increasing. Demand is not only in India, but overseas also. And may I tell you the cardiac anesthesia, uh, our fellowship is well recognized in many countries, um, SAR countries, Gulf countries. We get a lot of uh, requests for our fellows, from our fellows that we need a certificate that we have passed uh, fellowship fee at tacos. We need a certificate of FT. Provided uh, uh, the reason being, if you go, go for a job in Gulf, uh, if you have got a Fiat or FT or DM, they are better paid than uh, I mean, a person without a certificate. So that's a very promising uh, uh, response by overseas also. And uh, with that, I think uh, uh, this is what I wanted to say. And rest, uh, Dr. Tempesa will add to that. So thank you, Rajesh, and. Uh, Actually, uh, what fascinates me most about the cardiovascular system is its complexity. Uh, if to tell you a few things, the heart is the only organ which moves when it works, barring the intestines. And uh, the physiology is so complex that if you want to learn about mitral valve, why is it bicuspid and why the aortic valve is tricuspid? I don't know. There is no answer. In fact, uh, the famous uh, uh, mitral valve surgeon Carpentier from France. He wrote one editorial on uh, the mitral valve repair called as uh, uh, the French correction. And in that he describes mitral valve. He, he says that mitral valve is like a woman. Nobody has understood it. And till today we have not understood what why. We, I never knew that the annulus of the mitral valve moves when it, the valve closes and opens. The aortic valve annulus doesn't move. The tricuspid valve annulus doesn't move. Why is it that the mitral valve annulus has to move? So these are very fascinating and challenging physiological and like pathophysiological issues related to cardiovascular system, which make the anesthesia very challenging because you have to be on your toes and there are times when the hemodynamics change every minute and you have to you know regulate. So the capacity to manipulate the cardiovascular system that you possess at times which it fails and you get very disappointed. But to be able to manipulate the cardiovascular system to your liking is what makes this job very satisfying to me as far as I am concerned. So if you want to face challenges in your life, and if that gives you satisfaction, this is the Recording branch in progress. you should join. And uh, it will give you a sense of satisfaction. Money-wise, uh, as I mentioned, stopped. that uh, uh, money should be secondary and uh, the mental peace and sense of satisfaction is more important than money. But there is enough money in the field of cardiovascular anesthesia. And uh, if you get a faculty position nowadays, the 
uh, salaries are good in corporate world also the payments uh, payment is good for those who are aspiring to go abroad i think i think there was a lot of discussion on uh, pursuing your career in the, in the outside outside uh, india when we listen to the critical care uh, talk i think uh, we should go to the outside countries with the intention of learning few things or sharpening some of our skills that we do not have uh, to that extent as they are in some other recognized centers and that should be the objective of uh, leaving the country and uh, the aim should always be to come back and serve your own country because uh, no matter how lucrative the uh, money may be outside the country but uh, there are there is uh, some degree of uh, i don't know what word to use but uh, um, there are many professors of anesthesia in the us but there are very few chair persons there are many many senior professors who have reached that level but there are very few chair persons the chair person will be only the american so to my knowledge i don't think that there is any chairman of the department uh, who is an indian no, although i know many many qualified and very accomplished uh, cardiac anesthetist uh, in the in the us no so, i may add sir the, the dr swami madhav swami nathan was the uh, chair chair of uh, asc three years back well that's a professional organization i am talking of a chairman of the department they call it chairman we call it head of the department okay. they call it chair for that instance uh, ravi mahajan was the president of the uh, royal college of anesthetists so there is a big great accomplishment by these two guys and uh, one has to respect them to to be able to reach to these positions you have to perform at least twice as much as a local guy would perform so uh, if you get an opportunity if you uh, want to go abroad then the objective should be to learn new skills and you should choose a center that will provide you the skills that are deficient in this country or at your center because in in our country at the moment there are many centers which can provide uh, most of the skills to you barring a few for example 3d echocardiography in mitral valve repair because mitral valve repair is not uh, performed as uh, frequently as it is in the rest of the world so i think i'll stop there maybe if there are any questions nice to answer the questions rather than uh, giving a unilateral opinion of mine or dr rajesh yes sir there are a few questions the first one is how does one know if cardiac anesthesia is the branch one fits into what are the prerequisites if any sorry can you repeat the question what are the how does one know if cardiac anesthesia is the branch one fits into if uh, what are the prerequisites if any first thing is you should have a desire to become a cardiac anesthetist secondly you should be willing to work hard and number 3 you should be devoted because uh, uh, like most other cases you know you cannot leave your patient and go you have to be there with the patient Uh, till the patient is transferred to the icu because transferring a sick patient to the icu and putting him in back on the uh, monitors and uh, all the uh, things that are going on for example ecmo has become very common nowadays so many patients say if we are not worried about uh, failure to come off bypass nowadays if ecmo is available we put the, the surgeons put the patient on ecmo and they, they transfer the patient to the icu with the ecmo so transferring the such a patient is a, is a big job with all these gadgets so you should have a desire to be a cardiac anesthetist you should like that work you should like challenges and you should have uh, dedication and devotion and willingness to work hard these qualities you should have i i just add one thing that uh, i am in a medical college in uh, ludhiana and we have got a general anesthesia department with all uh, super specialty other than cardiac in one unit and many times we get we operate uh, general surgery or even uh, cesarean uh, sections in our cardiac ot uh, if they have got some cardiac issues if the patient has got lady has got some cardiac issues and the why why they have been operated with us because if anything goes wrong we have got uh, heart lung machine so the knowledge of heart lung machine and the presence of heart lung machine with us will give us extra advantage that we can we can uh, we can handle the general anesthesia cases or or other specialty anesthesia cases at our institute uh, and and if something goes then we are ready with a with a pump yes 
So the, that gives actually, an advantage of a, to a cardiac anesthetist. You uh, can re- rescue the patient. So I read one report in anesthesiology uh, on of an obstetric uh, patient, cesarean patient uh, who had uh, cardiovascular collapse, and the cardiac anesthetist was next door, and he came and rescued this patient and put the patient on ECMO, and the patient survived. So and he did the TE, and I don't exactly remember remember what findings did he uh, get on TE and and uh, instituted appropriate therapy. So one thing that a cardiac anesthetist uh, will achieve is a lot of confidence. You will not never be afraid of dealing with any kind of uh, hemodynamic compromise or collapse. The other day I was talking to one of the endoscopists, a gastroenterologist, and he said that while he was working in Fortis uh, uh, Fortis. Uh, was on this, which was earlier the uh, Dr. Trehan's hospital. Escort. So, what okay. high escorts? What is escorts? While he was working there, the some of the sometimes the cardiac anesthetist used to come and you know give sedation to the his patients. And he he recalled that sometimes the pressures used to go to 60, 50, and he used to get very agitated. And the cardiac anesthetist used to be very cool. He used to say, "Why are you worried about it? You take care of your work, and I will do my work." So he, he immediately noticed the difference in the confidence level that a cardiac anesthetist has versus that uh, a general anesthetist has. Not to undermine the any general anesthetist. In fact, I feel and believe that the general anesthetist should take up all these cases. They should learn all these skills of hemodynamic management, monitoring, and control. Uh, not to the extent of instituting bypass and uh, uh, transesophageal echo, but the focus uh, point of care, cardiac assessment, and the uh, hemodynamic manipulations, inserting PA catheters, arterial lines, CVP catheters. These are nowadays a requisite for almost all major non-cardiac surgery as well. So the, the um, general anesthetist or so non-cardiac anesthetist also should uh, learn these techniques so that the cardiac anesthetist is not required to be there uh, while they are dealing with a difficult case. So one thing that uh, cardiac anesthetist, as a cat, if you join cardiac anesthesia, one thing that you will definitely get is you will become very confident of dealing with any kind of scenario and no patient will you know bother you and you will never be afraid of uh, anesthetizing any patient uh, uh, well, a couple of just, just very very shortly uh, one one uh, incident i'll tell uh, the one of the indian uh, basketball player uh, team member lady uh, she was pregnant and she had aortic dissection and she was operated for dissection in caesarean in the same sitting Mm-hmm. So that is the level of confidence we get. And second thing, one of the sitting president of India, mm-hmm. when was operated, moment we it was he was given a bit of midazolam, the pressure dropped down to sixty, and everybody left the operation theater except the anesthetist and the cardiac anesthetist present there, and then so, the, the president yeah. survived. So this so, is the co- level of confidence we you get once you are handling the inotropes so frequently and so I mean. So fast and uh, so liberal. Combined surgeries have become very common nowadays. The Fortis uh, at uh, mm. Sake, they performed a transplant, liver transplant and aortic valve replacement in the same sitting. And this patient was handled by the cardiac anesthetist. So performing a non-cardiac surgery with cardiac surgery uh, is very common and in fact is one of the recommendations for dealing with such patients. So we have done many caesareans with valve replacements together in one sitting, cholecystectomies and valve replacement. Or CABG. These are very common in uh, used to be common in JVC. Somebody is asking so, about the salary of DM cardiac anesthesia as a fresher. As a fresher, uh, I would suggest don't think of salary. <laughs> join the no, DM, you, join you, no, no, let us answer that. As a DM student, if you join a government institution, you'll get a salary of a senior resident. If you join a DNB course in uh, cardiac anesthesia, the national board recommends that the salary should be equivalent to that of a, that of a senior resident. So if you are in uh, my battery is going down, so I may be offline anytime. But uh, so National Board recommends that you must pay equivalent salary as that of a senior resident in that particular state. So if you are in okay. Karnataka, you will get the salary. After DM, after DM, once they join as a cardiac anesthetist. After DM, after DM, though, depends on the, if you join the teaching faculty, you get the salary of a teacher. If you join a corporate hospital, you will get a post of attending first, then the junior consultant, then senior consultant. And salary will vary according to the different groups of hospitals. Demand and supply. Your market value is determined by how much is the payment given to a general, uh, uh, an average anesthetist in that particular field. So, uh, Deepika, are there any other questions or should we? Uh... So, there are a few questions. Be, be, be quick, be quick. 
uh, how's job prospects in cardiac anesthesia in india after dnb cardiac anesthesia sir dr rajesh if you can answer that i should connect my laptop on the because it's uh, I think, uh, low after, on the back after side. dnb dnb in cardiac anesthesia they are taken at par with the dm cardiac anesthesia and uh, especially in the corporate hospitals they they uh, really don't uh, mind having a dnb or dm uh provided they look uh, from which place you have done your super special sub specialty if you have done a dm course where at a place where only four cases are done in a, in a year then your value goes down and if you have done a dnb where there are uh, six cases per day if you are uh, conducting then your definitely experience as exposure is much better so apart from the uh, apart from the degree you hold Uh, every employer look at uh, which place you have done, done your uh, course from. That makes a big difference. For a cardiac anesthesiologist, how rewarding or professionally fulfilling is practicing interventional cardiology nowadays? See, interventional cardiology is going to take over. In fact, it has taken over many, many well, surgical cases. Despite that, the number of surgeries are still increasing in, in our country because the patient load is very high. In rest of the world, the number of cardiac surgeons uh, have decreased. The number of cardiac surgeries have decreased. But the interventional procedures such as uh, trans uh, TAVI or uh, balloon septostomy or uh, uh, mitral clip procedures, these are performed wherein the anesthetist uh, in the beginning, when the uh, interventionist is learning. when he is on the learning curve the anesthetist has to be inside the uh, cath lab and uh, most of these procedures also require transesophageal echocardiography so you need to administer general anesthesia and do the te for them so i recently written an editorial on as entitled cardiac anesthetist as an interventional echocardiographer because he helps the anest uh, the interventionist to perform his uh, procedure correctly but as the learning curve you know improves there are many centers which nowadays perform this under local anesthesia or monitored anesthesia care and do not need transesophageal echo they do it by transthoracic echo so but the newer procedures will be performed and the even if you you are not actually required inside the interventional cath lab the cardiologist always wants you to be around the cath lab you must be available as soon as he is he is in trouble he will need you and uh, and you may be paid handsomely for just being available in times to come so if the procedure takes 1 hour you may be just around the cath lab for about 1 hour just in case you are required and uh, you might get paid just for giving a moral support to the to the cardiologist i think uh, the 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 role of uh, echocardiographer that uh, cardiac anesthetists have taken over the echocardiography in their hand and uh, initially anesthesia was taken as a dependent branch on the surgeon or the cardiologist now with the eco the surgeons and the cardiologists they are dependent on us there are so many instances that what the report we give in intraoperatively depending on that the surgeon operates so it's a parallel field now for whether the surgeon is dependent on us or we are dependent on them so that's a big oh, thing and that is we are all interdependent <laughs> we are all interdependent i will not so say at that. least we are not dependent on them for everything now Yes, so, thank you, Doctor uh, Dr. Tempe Sir and Doctor Arya. And Doctor Arya, I request you to please answer some questions pertaining to cardiac anesthesia, which may come up uh, in the. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer them on and the chat box. Doctor uh, Palav Patak will answer your question after the neuro anesthesia session is over, because DM cardiac anesthesia versus DM DM neuro anesthesia. Once that talk is uh, there, then we'll take up that question, and then we'll uh, allow you to uh, express also. Uh, Uh, now i uh, hand it over to dr uh, neha and dr amit to carry forward the next session and uh, i request please we are uh, running uh, late so dr anurag dr zulfikar and dr anuja to please uh, stick to time so that we complete all the sessions and i am getting phone calls that they are all enjoying the sessions so they are very happy with the sessions but to stick to the time so thank you very much dr tempe sir and dr arya uh, for uh, gracing the occasion over to you dr neha and dr amit good evening everyone after such an informative session on cardiac anesthesia we are going to start next recording session recording in session. progress it gives me immense pleasure to invite our very own dr navin malhotra sir to enlighten the young anesthesiologist about the wonderful field of pain medicine 
सर इज सीनियर प्रोफेसर एंड हेड डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ कार्डियक एनेस्थीसिया इन पीजीआईएमएस रोहतक ही इज डेप्यूटी चेयर एट आर्स डब्ल्यू एफ एस ए वर्ल्ड फेडरेशन ऑफ सोसाइटी ऑफ एनेस्थीसियोलॉजिस्ट ऑनरेरी सेक्रेटरी सार्क एसोसिएशन ऑफ एनेस्थीसियोलॉजिस्ट एज वन द आई एस सी भोपाल अवार्ड फॉर एकेडमिक एक्सीलेंसन एक्सीलेंस 2015 APR Young Anesthesiologist National Award 2009, Pops Award for Trauma and Critical Care 2001. He has 216 publications in various national and international journals and 426 presentations. Dear ISN, relate to him as our own secretary. His areas of interest are chronic pain management and cardiac anesthesia. He is such a multi-talented person, an eloquent orator, a musician. teacher and with great organizational skills his endless ability and hard work continues to inspire all of us welcome sir now i would like to invite speaker for the session dr anurag agarwal he is pain spine physician and professor in department of anesthesiology dr ram manohar lohia institute of medical sciences in lucknow india he is member of pain board in national board of examinations Honorary Secretary Indian Society of Pain Clinicians he is founder president of Endoscopic Spine and Interventional Pain Society he is vice president UP chapter and he is member of Ethics Committee Cancer and Society his areas of interest are interventional pain and endoscopic spine management welcome and over to you sir dr anurag agarwal uh, thank you thank you very much uh, dr navin sir and the whole cap team Uh, for this wonderful initiative for the newbies of the and future of the anesthesiology and i am really happy to share uh, my experience um, i hope you can see my slide you can see my slides hello all good dr anwar please yes sir. so sir uh, as as most of our is uh, 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 listeners are newbies uh, so is the field of pain medicine which is a new b field uh, latest kit on the blog and we are going to talk little bit about the uh, why it is important to know about the pain medicine also known as chronic pain management uh, for our future generation of anesthesiologists the reason is this this is the latest study which has been done uh, and this is for the first time uh, it has been commissioned by the government of india and it has been published in the journal of pain which is the journal of international association for study of pain and it has been done by the center for population research mumbai here you can see the part of india which is darker they are having more patients of chronic pain and uh, in the another graph where you can see that uh, this uh, this another graph where they are getting the uh, treatment for the chronic pain so you can see the large part of indian population is suffering from various type of chronic pain Uh, the incidence is around 20 to 30 percent more in the age population. Uh, another data, a little bit of uh, from the CDC US, uh, one in five American. That means uh, every fifth American is suffering from chronic pain. More than 60 million people in America are suffering from chronic pain, and this costs billions of dollars. Uh, very common complaint: the incidence, depending on the different age groups, it's 11 to 40 percent. and most common cause is low back pain head ache migraine neck pain facial pain cancer pain where in cancer up to 90% of patients suffer from severe unrelenting chronic pain uh, women unfortunately suffer more and report more chronic pain across the world this is a world data and uh, as the age increases as eventually is going to happen with our country also the age of living is increasing so are the degenerative problems which are the major cause of chronic pain problems and billions of rupees billions of dollars are being spent on the uh, treatment of chronic pain so use venes and perhaps it is going to be the main ncd non communicable disease and a matter of concern to the whole world in coming few years uh, poor sleep most of the patients are depressed uh, many people when they do not able to make a diagnosis for the chronic pain they call that patient is depressed that's why uh, he or she is having pain but uh, we as a pain physician knows it, uh, it uh, as a matter of fact that uh, because of pain they are being depressed once you treat their pain they get better uh so what is pain medicine now the question arises why do we need to learn talk about it so is it the post operative peri operative pain management the answer is big big no this is the post operative and peri operative pain management is the part of mainstream anesthesiology services that is the peri operative care 
is it acute pain management someone is having some bumps here and there and uh, is having or is uh, someone is having renal colic is it the job of a pain physician to treat with it no that is uh, part uh, of uh, managed by every doctor with every specialty depending on their special uh, so what is pain medicine it is a new and emerging super specialty of anesthesiology i beg to differ from my previous speaker dr rajesh in in india there are no sub specialties uh, cardiology is not a sub specialty of medicine it is considered a super specialty so should be the pain medicine uh, like the neurosurgery is the super specialty of surgeon uh, it includes the evaluation and treatment of chronic pain which is considered when pain lasts for more than 3 months this is the most commonly accepted definition of the chronic pain word and it requires at least one year or more of formal structured in house training in pain medicine after post md or dnb anesthesia uh, as i said earlier many uh, conditions which causes a very common condition you we all know about them they call cause chronic pain and what does a pain physician do we treat and manage chronic persistent unrelenting pain by the multimodality and what are the treatment options we start like on all other uh, treatment in the all other clinical branches with the pharmacological methods and then comes our niche that is mipsy and what is mipsy this is minimally invasive pain and spine intervention that is the umbrella term of our interventions uh, like it is there in the cardiology with the name of pci percutaneous cardiac intervention so this is the umbrella term what of we do in the pain medicine and then comes the non pharmacological therapies which we actually don't do but we guide our patient towards the specialist of those uh, non pharmacological therapies like the acupuncture biofeedback hypnosis physiotherapy and chiropractic so many of them so um, all these condition again just to remind you a uh, lot of condition everyday condition perhaps most of us are going to face one or other of these condition in our uh, long life uh, so like the same of our population and what are the common mipsies again start from the radio frequency treatment cryoablation neuromodulation pain biological or regenerative therapies vertebral augmentation like the vertebroplasty kyphoplasty and the latest thing one of the main major focus is on the percutaneous spine endoscopy neuromodulation spinal cord stimulation so many of them and every new every other day new interventions are coming into the fore and our armamentary is getting bigger and better so what are the treatment steps to consider when we treat a chronic pain patient to identify the best method of treatment and more importantly define distinct goals for the patient that may be pain reduction and more than the pain reduction is the improved function and enhanced quality of life so uh, please mind it chronic pain like uh, all other chronic diseases like the uh, hypertension diabetes um, hypothyroidism and so many kidney disease liver disease unfortunately many of time the chronic pain is also not cured by any of the things uh, except they can be beautifully managed so what are the mips they are the interventions minimally invasive percutaneous to diagnose and treat the pain generators and they are done under continuous x ray guidance and known as fluoroscopy like the cath lab or ultrasound uh, ultrasound to avoid errors so what are the benefits they are almost painless they are usually day care procedures they are cost effective they obviate the need of open surgery and associated complication in most of the patient and cost so what are the specific needs of mipsies it looks similar to regional anesthesia but it is not uh, please mind it uh, uh, for most of the anesthesiologists they confuse the uh, mipsies with the regional anesthesia it is entirely and absolutely different one it is different why because in regional anesthesia the main focus is to anesthetize a part of body for a certain period of duration with the motor and sensory blocking but here in the pain medicine the aim of any mipsy which we offer to our patient of chronic pain to provide the longest term of pain relief without any sensory motor anesthesia perhaps a cure so they are not blocks or injections they are complete treatment when we remove a disc through the endoscope it is the treating the prolapsed uh, disc we are not managing it we are treating it and there is no role of conventional blind epidural steroids and cm fluoroscopy and ultrasound are must they are standard of care and they require complete ot set why we as an anesthesiologist have an is because as the mipsies are the niche of pain medicine anesthetists have an natural skill to do minimally invasive interventions near the spine like the spinal uh, subarachnoid block or epidurals 
And this is a part of mainstream anesthesia. Empathy and honesty are the virtues who come naturally to anesthesiologists and which is very important for us. And quest for me. What are the specific needs? Willingness to learn more and for long term, at least one year or more formal training is required. And I will tell you about the options available currently. Investment in terms of money and time. It is also very important to understand that here you have to hunt your patient and you have to share it. Uh, it is other way around in the mainstream anesthesia practice. Someone else is hunting for you and you are getting a ship. But here you need to market, you have to invest. And here, very important thing. In anesthesia, there is always an all woman phenomenon. The spinal ka effect aega ya nahi aega. Whether the spinal is working or not, brachial flexor block is working or not, tube is going or not. But in pain medicine, it is always in between, like in all other clinical branches. And you need to ready to market yourself. There's no more uh, behind the curtain job. Uh, some specific advice is be ready to work in very hard in unknown territories. Why unknown? Because you need to learn about a lot of musculoskeletal things. You need to learn radiology a lot. You need to learn uh, neurology, orthopedic examination and all that. No comparatively early and easy setups. Here. In Just after doing the MD anesthesiology or DNB anesthesiology, you get a starting, uh, you start getting calls from across the board. Uh, please come and join us, please come and join us. But here, no, it's a clinical branch. It takes time to get established. Here, bouquets are yours, so are the patients. In anesthesiology, someone is there between you and the patient. Here, you are the friend. And pain medicine is a full-time job. Bit of anesthesia, bit of critical care, bit of pain medicine doesn't fit. The anesthesiologist need to say when to say no. So, this is the list of uh, government institutions where uh, uh, we are having formal uh, standardized courses with a fixed curriculum and entry and exit exam. And this is the main part uh, which I've been interested with. Uh, DM pain medicine. This is the first and foremost course of the India uh, as well as perhaps most likely in the entire world. And this is the first NMC uh, or MCI recognized DM courses. Then comes the PDCC pain medicine, IEMS, BHU, Varanasi durations, one year. And this is the oldest formal course in pain medicine, which has been conceptualized and started by Professor Virendra Rastogi, who incidentally was the founder secretary of the Indian Society for Study of Pain, as well as the founder president for the Indian Society of Pain Clinicians. Uh, he actually form, uh, thought that uh, formal uh, training is required for the pain medicine. Then comes the PDAF, SGPG, IMS, Lucknow to their direction, then in multiple places like AIMS, KGIMU, AIMS Rishikesh, Aligarh Muslim University and whole list. And then very important thing happened just uh, two years back, uh, thanks to Dr. Naveen Malhotra sir for taking a lead into it, that uh, we have started FNB payments. This is again a registrable degree from the NBEMS two year duration and from this session, Two batches, first time in the India, one at Chennai Super Specialty Hospital and one at Sardangaram Hospital has been admitted for FNB payments. So these are the list of government institutions. Then there are non-government but university recognized courses. Again, usually of one year or one and a half year duration. Uh, one of them is MUHS affiliated courses for fellowship in chronic pain medicine at different places in Mumbai and Pune. And then comes the DY Patil in Mumbai, then with the Peet uh, University Medical College, and then at uh, Marasad Shri Guru Ramdas and uh, Guru Ram Rai, both institute, and Mysore also. They are having a university recognized but non governmental, but uh, with the formal entry and exit. The complete list of educational opportunities in the pain medicine can be found at the website of Indian Society of Pain Clinician. You can note it down. Another uh, fellowship is which is very important and uh, has been granted by the Indian Society of Study of Pain. This is known as FIAPM. Duration is one year and list of centers accredited by ISSP for IAPM can be found on their website www.issp.pain.org. Uh, so, once you have done the course, you are mad enough about to enter into the pain medicine as we want uh, to some of you be. Uh, what are the options uh, for the after doing a course? So in government sector, National Medical Council, the asked why MCI is yet to recognize the pain medicine as a separate super special. So if you want to join the government sector, you need to work in the mainstream anesthesiology department with all its pros and cons. So you better take the 
consciousness. But at the same time, this is a huge opportunity are there, both in corporate hospitals and private practice. Actually, we are having a supply crunch. Uh, there are a lot of demand, but we do not have people ready to jump into the frame, uh, ready to ride the boat. Socially and financially, I believe that it is going to be a cardiology in the coming few years. So please take your call. And this is a teamwork. You need a complete dedicated pain medicine <laughs> OT as well as OPD. And this is our teammate, Dr. Raman This is my Facebook channel and uh, YouTube channel. And I would be happy to help you uh, for any question and related to pain medicine in future. So greetings. And this is what I was talking about. So it is no more of a back of a curtain job. Uh, it gives you a lot of recognition. Uh, once we treat our patient with the results and you may get a place uh, on the front page of Times of India also. So thank you. Greeting from the Dr. Ramanulo Institute of Medical Science in Lucknow. And this is my WhatsApp number and email for me. Thank you for your patient listening. And I hope that we have some discussion. Over to Dr. Naveen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anurag, for uh, that. It didn't take too much of time. Thank you for the whole of the uh, aspect of the pain medicine. Uh, Nia, any questions? Samit and Nia, please. Yes, sir. Uh, so, as sir has rightly mentioned about the FNB programs that has been started this year, but it has been started with very few number of seats. So, sir, can you please throw in uh, a light about the future of this FNB program? Because it seems very viable, a two-year course, good enough time to learn pain medicine, especially after MD anesthesia. So, Naveen, sir, uh, can you please guide us? See, uh, this is a landmark uh, decision in the history of pain medicine. Our uh, seniors and uh, they have done so much for the recognition and establishment of pain medicine. And this is the first step towards the ultimate goal of starting DM pain medicine. This is the recognized course by NBEMS and simultaneously NMC. Two years dedicated course for anesthesiologist post MD and DNB. And the curriculum has been written by the anesthesiologist. Well, to be honest, the whole curriculum, I have written it down word by word. And the, the whole team supported us. There is a policy, the procedure has to be followed. This course was conceived before the COVID times, the COVID delayed it, but then there are centers which have to accredited it. And I'm very sure in the next session, more and more centers are applying for accreditation to the National Board of uh, examination in medical sciences and next year in the next session definitely the FET exam right now I understand there are only three seats one in Gangaram and two in Chennai but next year we will be having more number of seats and more and more number of institutes will be applying for uh, this particular course and yes those who want to pursue career in pain medicine this is a recognized course by National Board of Examination and NMC and it is a very very useful course you, you can opt for it and undergo Exclusive training in uh, the in the field of pain medicine, but our ultimate aim is uh, we are pursuing uh, the Indian Society of Anesthesiologists, uh, Indian Society of Study of Pain, and Indian Society for uh, uh, ISPC, the pain clinicians. We are all working together, and we have represented it to NMC formally also and met there multiple times and other uh, authorities met the governor of the UP or the governor of the Assam and other uh, concerned that there is a dire need for starting DM in pain medicine. And we have submitted the proposal also along with the requisite documents. And we are very hope with the collective efforts, we will be soon in, uh, achieving our long-term vision of having DM in pain medicine. Right. And I would like to uh, say a line that uh, we want to assure you, uh, future generation of anesthesiology people, that uh, this time we are conscious and we are aware that we are not going to commit the same mistake which uh, have been happened with the critical care some 20, 30 years back. We are trying tooth and nail to keep it reserved for you guys, pain medicine as a super specialty of anesthesiology rather than to make it a multi specialty. Uh, as uh, the cardiology is reserved for the general medicine. So <laughs> I would like to give you as, uh, this as an uh, assurance uh, to you guys on the behalf of all three societies, yeah, ISA, ISSP and ISPC. 
so that we will have separate departments. We will have a lot of seats on TM in every college and every institution of the India. Earnest efforts are being made at all levels. Uh, and we are, to be honest, myself, Dr. Anurag and uh, Dr. Parvesh, we have personally went to NMC and talked to the chairperson of the PG Medical Wood Education. And we all are working under the guidance of our seniors also to ensure that we become teachers of DMP in medicine and you all become students of DMP in medicine. Yes. So are there any other questions? Uh, sir, not there really, sir, but... Yeah, please, Amit. Uh, what is the scope of short courses in pain medicine, like uh, of duration one yeah. month? And yeah, one I saw that in chat box also. And uh, see, this short uh, courses. I, I, I would like to say one line. Look, uh, in the previous talk about the cardiac anesthesia, someone asked a very pertinent question that how would I know that I am interested in cardiac anesthesia or not? So these short courses are very good. These short courses, conferences, workshops, they are very good during their your duration uh, in the MD or DM to check whether it is a cup of tea or not. Because as, as I said earlier, pain medicine is the latest, newest kid on the block. So in many of the institutions uh, during the MD anesthesiology, you don't get the proper exposure to them, uh, to the pain medicine or sometimes uh, the, for the cardiac anesthesia also. So it's better uh, after taking the uh, due permissions uh, from your seniors and teachers, you please join these courses, you join the workshops, the conferences during uh, that MD duration so that you can make a conscious and early decision uh, while you are clearing your MD and DM. But certainly they cannot replace, no course of the short duration cannot replace uh, the formal training uh, in any stream, uh, leave aside the payments. So there, are, there, there are many questions coming up in chat box, which me and Dr. Anurag will answer uh, for the benefit right. of the audience. And uh, they will be live for all to see. And uh, thank you, Dr. Anurag, for joining us today. And uh, I hand it over to Dr. Ankur Kandelwal to carry it forward. Thank, thank you, for, sir, and your team. And also best wishes for all the students who are listening uh, to make a conscious choice there about their careers. Thank you. Dr. Thank you very much. Over, over to you, Ankur. Recording stopped. Uh, thank you, sir. After that uh, wonderful session.